um, yesterday. And we are up on YouTube. I, I do not know if Councilwoman Jackson is joining. Well, we'll go through the agenda and we'll put Folly Road at the end if that's okay with you all. And if she joins in, great. If not, we will um, buzz through that too. That's a yellow, okay? Excellent. I'd like to, um, what's today's date? What is today's date? I'd like to call to order the October 13th, um, 2020 meeting of the City of Charleston Traffic and Transportation Committee. Thank you all for being here. Um, and for those who aren't, you're going to miss something exciting. Um, if we could begin with a moment of silence or an invocation from Council Member Del Chapo, please. please. Um, I'll do an invocation. Great. You all might have heard on the news of the three members of the same family that were killed up on Nexton Parkway on Sunday. And that was actually one of my very dear friends, her mom, <laughs> brother, and sister in law. Um, and obviously, one of the things we do here is try to make our roads as safe as possible. So I have an invocation pertaining to unexpected tragic death. Lord, I bring before you today those who are having to go through such a tragic loss and pray that you would be very close to each one that is in mourning today over such a loss and are perhaps confused or even angry that such a devastating occurrence has undertaken them without any warning. You are the God of all comfort who comforts us in a time of need and I pray that those who are facing such a difficult trial today, uphold them and draw very close to them. Raise up, I pray, the right people to minister to them and to be a genuine comfort and support at this time of tragedy and grief. Lord, I do not understand why our loved ones should suddenly be removed from us through a sudden unexpected death but I trust in you to soothe the way the hurt in time for shall not the God of all the earth do right in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, minutes. Do we have minutes from our last meeting of motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Additions, deletions, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. Um, I see Council Member Jackson's here, so we can just stick with our um, regular program. First on our agenda is the Glen McConnell Parkway Maintenance Agreement. Mr. Benjamin, is that you? Yes, sir. And um, i just take two quick seconds to um, introduce this. Um, as you know, Glen McConnell Widening is one of the main sales tax projects that are being completed by Charleston County, um, but they have been extremely collaborative in making uh, this project uh, what it uh, can be. Um, it's, it's a complete streets effort. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely widening the right of way. It's addressing um, drainage issues. Um, it's bringing multimodalism through multi-use pathways from Beast Ferry all the way uh, through Magwood. And also um, it's taking into consideration the regional transit framework plan that was completed by the Tri-County Council of Governments that looked at what not only where Low Country Rapid Transit will be um, in its initial phase, but also where it could potentially be in the future. And so the process of the widening that the county has taken into consideration um, also um, uh, leaves room for that actualization if that's something to occur in the future as well. Obviously, streetscape aspects as well, landscaping and otherwise. So there's a number of things within this maintenance agreement that some of which fall within um, our department's belly with some of which falls within others. Um, but uh, thanks to the help from the legal team, we're bringing it um, just to this uh, committee. Uh, and so the maintenance agreement is with SCBOT for all of their, what they would call non-standard items, uh, whether that's the multi-use pathway, uh, the mast arms that are gonna be introduced, uh, some of the landscaping aspects and otherwise. And so what's before you is uh, for uh, the city to take on those maintenance responsibilities. This is one of the steps in county moving forward with bidding out this contract and uh, getting this work um, going, but happy to take any questions you all might have. I'm muted. Any questions for Mr. Benjamin about this? What does this mean in terms of dollars? Do we know? Um, we, we don't know, but um, a number of these things, um, and, and I know this is a broader conversation, but a number of these things uh, are various cities, departments already taking on responsibility of. So for example, um, SCBOT does not maintain mass arms. That's always falls within our responsibility. So anytime we introduce that, that's the case. Um, Multi-use pathways and sidewalks um, for public service, um, any new ones that are there, that's the same thing. 
uh, with that as well as like garbage and benches and different things that might be introduced. Lighting uh, is one of the other things that are listed in there. Our parks department always takes those responsibilities on. So these are things that are um, um, aspects that different departments already takes on, but they needed to be codified within an agreement process for that. But um, don't yet know what the um, long-term cost aspects are um, of, it, of it on this particular project. Are we going to have to adopt similar agreements on future projects? Isn't there some sort of general standard agreement we can have with the DOT or with the county? Um, I, 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 this doesn't I seem very efficient to me, but I mean, just... understood. And I, I think yes, it's not it's not it's not that efficient. But I <laughs> Sorry, also I mean... also think I also think that it there's a number of conversations from both a collaboration standpoint, but also um how we work on infrastructure projects going into the future that i think might change how these agreements are formed and and what's prioritized and what's not right um some would argue that a multi-use path is standard right um but well, it that, should that, be for any new projects but, going forward right yes sir but well it's not our right of what right so um and 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 what that what's defined as standard and non-standard so um that, that's the circumstance in this type of situation all right, any other questions for Mr. Benjamin? Ms. Borden, is there anything you need to add to this as our lawyer? No, sir, I've, re I've reviewed it and, and, and approved it. All right, so on advice and counsel, both our director and our lawyer, do I have a motion? I move for approval, Mr. Second. Chairman. Oh, you have a second? Did I hear a second from Council Member Brady? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Excuse me, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. All right, next is um, the Folly Road Maintenance Agreement. Ah, so, so to back to, to my to, comment about efficiency. <laughs> yeah, not, not just to efficiency, but to the process as well. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to explain this one. It's a little bit complicated, but um, I, you know, we have the Rethink Folly Road process and county is moving towards implementation. Um, one of the things that was passed within our city budget, I think almost almost three years ago, um, but I'll say two to be on the safe side, was an allocation towards the match dollars to get all the funding to execute on um, this project. So this is not a request for um, funding. This is a request for maintenance in the future. Um, this agreement is between the city and the town of James Island, specifically because through the coordination efforts of the James Island and it, governmental committee and otherwise, um, the request was to make sure that as we think about multimodalism, that we introduce new features um, that may have not been introduced before. Um, obviously in some portions of this Folly Road corridor, there's already um, bike um, infrastructure, um, but not necessarily the um, traffic type of paint and otherwise that's usually associated with that type of infrastructure. Again, um, currently in the design standards for the state DOT, um, that type of paint is considered non-standard. Uh, and so that's outside of their scope of what they uh, normally maintain. And so the agreement that's before you is specifically and only about um, the bike um, um, paint that would be um, added within the corridor of Folly Road. Now, we will have to come back to you to the point of council member seeking this efficiency. We're just getting more efficient the further we get into this meeting. It's amazing. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm just trying to follow process. Um, I got you. Um, um, where there'll be a similar type of agreement that you just saw with Glen McConnell, that's outside of the bike lane aspect, but regarding the multi-use areas that'll be added there, the enhanced intersections that have non-standard materials and anything else that um, falls within that non-standard category with the, with the state DOT. So th that this, this is specifically about an intergovernmental agreement between uh, City of Charleston, town of James Island, specifically around the bike um, infrastructure that will be at the bike paint to be even more specific. So, so I guess the good news is we're focused on multimodalism. That's always good. The bad news is it doesn't seem particularly efficient, but um, for purposes of keeping things standardized and looking good, I guess this is a good thing. I see Councilmember Jackson has her hand up. I guess this goes right Thank through you, the Mr. middle Chairman. of the district. I'll move for approval of this uh, agreement uh, with the town of James Island. Um, I, I did just want to, well, is there a second? Second. We have a second. Okay. I just, I just wanted to explain a little bit. I, I know that all of my colleagues that are on this meeting um, 
our new, um, since the Folly Road uh, vision um, work was done, and it too is a complete streets plan. So um, this, this particular segment, uh, all of Folly Road is, is um, envisioned to be um, served by a multi-use path that would at some point go on both sides of Folly Road, east and west. In this case, it's gonna be a hybrid. Uh, we agreed on the first segment to be done under the county um, funding the, the 20, I think it's the 2006 half penny if I'm correct. And the money was there to actually make the wider path that would have taken a multimodal off the street. But um, because of the impediments of the huge transmission lines, if any of you've driven on Folly Road, we have, we have those huge big ones. And it was just impossible to try and, you know, even consider relocating any of those. So we settled for an eight foot sidewalk that's gonna be much bigger than, and to allow, you know, a combination of, of walkers and strollers and things like that. But the bikes still have to stay on the road surface. And the compromise for that was the design was to create the, the green bike lane, widen the bike lane from three feet to four feet and keep it painted so that it literally is a, a much, you know, more safe um, design feature. So. I, I, the whole steering committee supported that a couple of years ago, and now it's just time to you know, sort of put our, our, our labor where, I'm, where our mouths are. I think the town will rely on us to do the bulk of the maintenance, but they certainly will play their part. Okay, um, got it. Any other questions? This one seems fairly straightforward. All right, I think we had a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. All right, next, um, I've been looking forward to this all day. Um, resolution for approval to establish a quiet zone. <laughs> all right, Mr. Benjamin, tell us what this one's all about. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction and then, and then uh, hand it off to Chip. So um, we were approached by the development site that's occurring off of Johnson and Morrison. Um, they had done a sound study. Um, there's a rail line that goes to the back of their property that connects to the port. Um, it's, it's very heavily used um, on a regular basis. Um, and they found that um, the amount of times that they have to blow um, the horn of the train was uh, a large number. Um, and specifically because there's uh, not necessarily accommodations at that crossing. It's not heavily trafficked at all. Um, there's signage there and otherwise um, for that. Um, but that's um, about it. Um, where you see Palmetto Rails, uh, railways is, is where that line crosses to the south of where you where it's off the screen is where Morrison is. You have Ravenel Bridge um, exit going um, uh, coming off of East Bay, Morrison um, towards Mount Pleasant. Uh, and so they approached us about wanting to pursue a uh, quiet zone. Now, um, I think most of council except for um, chairman um, uh, have, were not here when uh, the quiet zone was approached for Washington uh, Street. But essentially, and just as simplified as possible, uh, when a quiet zone is pr pursued with the Federal Rail um, Administration, the entity that owns the public right of way has to be the sign off entity to allow it to be the case. Um, it just so happens the city owns Johnson Street. Um, however, the developer came to us and said, look, uh, we want this quiet zone. Um, we will make it happen um, financially. Uh, we will take on the maintenance responsibility. We just need the city to sign off. And there's a particular process with it that's followed. I'll let Chip fill in those blanks. But what's coming before you is a resolution process um, to trigger that opportunity and also um, the, uh, uh, the permission to move forward with an MOA with uh, the development group um, to get on paper what they said that they would uh, commit to. But I'll, I'll let Chip kind of give the specific nuances. And I have to apologize, looking at the agenda, I realized I did not attach the Exhibit A, which is the MOA with um, the developers uh, for this resolution. I'm gonna go through it, and if you, if you all need to defer it for more time, um, we can deal with that. I don't think it'll be anything um, crazy. It, it, it's a little bit long, but it's pretty standard language if you're familiar with the 835 Savannah Highway um, project. So the 
quiet we all, zone. We all are. It's right at the tip of our tongues. We know all about that project. It's, it's amazing. That's the thrift store our, on, our in instant, Avondale. Our so, instant recall is incredible in this game. It, it, it's a, yeah. It's, um, so essentially what we're doing is we're allowing someone, a third party, to go within our right-of-way and make improvements that would permit um, Palmetto Railways, the, the trains going – uh, crossing Johnson Street to not blow their horns or not blow their horns as much. The improvements required will be gates and flashing lights. The city will not pay anything towards this, will not agree to maintain any of this. And as a result, um, we prepared an MOU to enter into with the developers who will be responsible for constructing the gates and the lights and maintaining the gates and the lights moving forward. The MOA essentially provides uh, two important documents is, is exhibits and, and one is um, a temporary access and construction easement agreement. This just allows the developers to go onto the within Johnson Street and construct the improvements, the gates and the flashing lights. Um, it's we use pretty much the same form, you know, the whereas is are typically changed, but use pretty much this same form anytime someone goes into our right of way to make improvements. Um, the, um, the, where is it? The, one of the provisions of the MOA will require a, um, let me see if I can find it. Standard uh, insurance, you know, required insurance minimums. So the developers will have to keep an insurance policy in place while they're utilizing our right of way and provide us proof of insurance. Um, in addition to agreeing to indemnify us for any problems that arise with respect to the uh, improvements that are constructed within our right of way. Um, the temporary access agreement again allows them to go on and make the improvements. The covenants, which are very similar to what we would require for stormwater improvements. Um, basically are covenants that the owners of those properties will continue to maintain the improvements after they're constructed as opposed to them being dedicated to the city. Uh, like the covenants for permanent maintenance of stormwater facilities, which is a standard document, um, the city would have the right to go in in the event of an emergency or if it finds non-compliance with the safety standards um, in the agreement make improvements and then uh, seek reimbursement from the owners. And if the owners do not reimburse, place a lien on their properties. Um, that's, that's pretty much the, the, the substance of the MOA, the access agreement and the covenants for permanent maintenance of the quiet zone improvements. Um, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions any of you may have. Um, so. So before we get to questions, let me just see if I understand. The way we got to here is this, that the applicant for the quiet zone improvements has to be the owner of the right of way, which happens to be the city, because that's Johnson Street. We're then gonna partner up through MOU with the developer to build the required improvements to then make it a quiet zone, so there'll be less horn blowing. We're gonna then leave it to the developer to build and maintain in perpetuity the crossing Yes, sir. That's the plan. The and other option is to accept dedication of the improvements and maintain them ourselves. I get it. Yep. I mean, the, yep. the, the lawyer in me says this, you know, developers come and go, cities are pretty much here forever. Who knows what's going to happen 10 years down the road if, if these aren't maintained and, it, and an arm fails or a light goes out and someone gets injured. Then I think we have to be adults here and realize it may come back to the city somewhere down the road, right? I mean, I yep. don't know there's enough protections in the world we could put in any agreement, whether we've seen it or not to give us the protections we need going. And Mr. Chair, one of the reasons why this was approaching this way, and, and I, I don't say this in an adversarial way, say it as a willingness to cooperate and collaborate with them is they're gonna approach us with that request and it's gonna, to, to go to the Federal Rail Administration, the city will have to sign off on it. You know, if we're right. gonna be putting our name on the dotted line, but, you know, they gotta make it happen. All right, but does the MOU chip have some form of indemnity agreement for third party tort liability? It does, yes. Okay. And it requires insurance. Right. I mean, again, I'm not sure what that does for us 10 years down the road, but 
I guess. For it, now you know, okay. and here's, you know, for, I don't know how familiar you all are with the covenants for permanent maintenance for stormwater facilities, but pretty much any time we allow a residential subdivision development, we would uh, agree to take the roads, the drainage conveyance systems that serve our roads or the dedicated roads. And then we enter into an agreement where the developer and any successor entitled to the property owned by the developer agrees to maintain the stormwater ponds on the, on the property, which um, the city would otherwise have to maintain. The city reserves the right to inspect those areas and to go in and improve those areas if the developer doesn't or, or homeowners association usually eventually um, doesn't make any, take any corrective measures within a certain period of time. We have the immediate right to go onto the property and take corrective measures if we find there's an emergency. And then we can charge a, we, we basically collect the fee from the HOA. The HOA doesn't, doesn't pay, it's, it's a, a lien on all the properties within the HOA. I don't know that we've ever done that, placed a lien on those properties, but that's, that's the general policy that we have for, for those, which is why I use that mechanism. I get it. And I'll, I'll yep. let other members of the committee ask some questions. I might have one or two more. All right. Any, any members of the committee have a question or anybody want to see this MOU before we actually vote on it? I guess that's the first question that I have for the committee. Mr. Chairman, can, can yes, you just go on and explain the process with the full council? If, if, if we would agree to um, recommend the resolution today, then what comes before the council or, and when? Uh, I think the resolution then becomes a matter of council to take up. And if we agree, then Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Queenie go to work and put the resolution together and get it executed between the city and the developer. Am I right about that? There won't be a second bite at this apple after today for voting. For us. Right. Correct. Right. Yes. Unless there's, unless the city has to spend any monies towards the improvements, this is allowing them to make the improvements, not us agreeing to, to partner with them to make the improvements. So, and this is all subject to approval of the Federal Transit Administration, right? Or whoever yeah. it is up there yes, in sir. Washington. Yes, sir. And this is really a step in that in that process. So. Right. I personally don't have any problem with, uh, you know, um, resolving this today. So, um, but I maybe I'm in a minority. Well, look, I mean, this is this is an example in some ways of just the government run amok. There's so many different hands in this thing. If we can help. Get it moving forward i'm fine with that too because this isn't this application or this mou is going to take some time to put it all together and get up to fta right or are you ready to go keith well yeah so here's the thing the um all the legwork is out of the city's hands too okay so that, that, that's probably, yeah, yeah. the only thing that they needed from us is our agreements that we would allow it and okay. so ship's work is to as best as possible protect us um, and and take all the responsibility of actually paying for it, building it, maintaining it out, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, and as long as they're agreeable to that, then you know we give that sign off, and then they move forward with the application process. Well, for those of you who don't know who Morrison Yard Owner LLC is, they're pretty responsible, and they're local developers. But that's any consolation to us, and they've been yeah. fairly responsible in all this stuff. I, Anyway, do, do, do I have a motion from the committee and then we can discuss it and move it forward or not? I'll move for approval. Councilmember Again. Jackson, Councilmember Brady. Um, any other discussion, Councilmember Del Chapo? Uh, Councilmember Brady, sorry. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, similar to the Washington Street quiet zone, um, is the city responsible for putting the signs up that notify that the horn won't be sounding uh, similar to how it is when you cross on Washington? that will be part of the developer's responsibility the washington street was just a different animal because it was it was to serve a greater you know larger um portion of our population including including existing uh developments this is to serve two new developments in that area great thank you so councilman del chapo i'm blocked so any questions no so I guess, Chip, we just leave it on your broad shoulders to keep an eye on this, make sure it all gets crossed and dotted and sent up correctly, and I guess report back to us when it's in place. I suspect when this is all done, this will be a fairly busy intersection. So I think we just need to be prepared for that. But that's some number of years down the road. I mean, that there's- it, Well, I mean, all the traffic to the two new developments does not cross, does not go across the crossing. This is really noise 
affecting the development more than concern over increased traffic. Um, I'm thinking more about foot traffic. I think there's with this development they were talking about water access and access over there to the docks and all that. That so, may be true, yes, sir. Yeah, and, and you know, I, but railroad litigation in South Carolina is infamous, and they'll go after everybody. So let's just make sure we do the best we can with this thing. Okay. All right. Any other comments, questions, concerns about this agreement? Um, this is going to be by resolution, so it'll be the last time we see it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. The ayes have it. Uh, next on our agenda is Mr. Benjamin. Hey, everybody. So um, just wanted to go through a few things with you. Uh, some of it might be repetitive, but um, um, you all are not the only council members who ping me about transportation issues and questions. So um, just want to uh, bring a couple of things up um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So if you remember about a year and a half ago, I had Josh Johnson come and do a presentation to you all uh, because SEDOT was planning um, to move forward on um, basic improvements to various different intersections throughout West Ashley um, at their signalized intersections, whether that was pedestrian signals or whether that was uh, missing crosswalks or whether that was um, uh, backup battery systems or um, different pieces like that with the infrastructure of the signal system. So they've been working on that all throughout this time. Um, there's various intersections where those improvements are coming to. Let me be clear that this is, this is SEDOT's project. Um, that because of the signal maintenance agreement that the city has with SCDOT will be responsible for maintaining and operating after they do. So this is all funded by them. This is their contractors. And uh, otherwise, we're involved in the process because ultimately we need to know what's going on for us to fulfill what's necessary with the signal maintenance agreement. I'm going to bring it up because we've gotten a lot number of questions about signal, what's happening. People are seeing folk at intersections and otherwise. And so just wanted to give these 10 intersections um, um, there are some that are along 17, some of them are along seven, where SEDOT is currently either has finished or is doing work. Um, Dobbin, Savage Road, Ashley Town Center, um, Sam Ridge, I-526, Skylark Road. And then along seven, I-526, Skylark, Orleans, and DuPont Road. And again, um, at those intersections, there's some pedestrian improvements that might be coming to them, battery backup systems, which essentially means if the power goes out, those signals will still be able to function for a certain amount of time um, still there um, as well. The other piece I want to bring up is uh, for 61, um, as we've been working with SCDOT about traffic signal responsive technology along that corridor. Again, a project that SCDOT is doing, contracted by their consultants, but because we will have to operate and maintain, we have to be involved in the traffic signal response is literally uh, the middle middle ground between um, what we currently have throughout most of the city where you just plug and play with different phasing and what you might see in Mount Pleasant along Johnny Dodds where it's uh, completely responsive based on how traffic might be at any moment in time. Traffic signal response is essentially you have sets of different phases um, that you can immediately click into to respond, especially at peak hour. Um, and, and it's able to be adaptive to that time. So not saying you'll fix all the traffic on 61, but it's one of those tools in the toolbox um, that a CDOT will be um, bringing to the table that we'll have to operate and maintain. So I wanted to bring those up. Uh, I know they were talked about um, uh, bringing forth those about a year and a half ago, and I, I just wanted to make sure, put those pieces on the record. Um, uh, Council Member Del Chapel, Fairchild and Island Park Drive. Um, so uh, there was COVID-19 delays from that contractor, but all of the equipment has been received as of last week. Um, the contract is planning to uh, come back to uh, get back on the good foot with installation on October 19th. And so those things are the camera installations, the video detecting, all the cameras, um, the concrete foundations, um, all the ADA ramp stuff, and then markings will come in after that. So still a number of things to do at that intersection, but stuff is moving and trying to press on that contract that we get on the good foot with that project. Um, thanks to Councilmember Brady, um, we, we got, we have, we have parklets, uh, coming, uh, and, and being installed. And otherwise, Councilman Brady, um, asked for us to bring this to bike pay committee and follow through. And so, uh, last week, officially Baba's on Cannon Street, um, introduced there. It, it looks amazing. And, um, we actually have about three other different entities or sets of businesses that have also inquired about the usage of parking areas, uh, for being able to expand their business capacities and otherwise. Um, there's 
as Councilman Seekins has already heard this through the Central Business District, there is a number of hoops that we have to jump through um, in using um, SEDOT right of way. Um, and so that has its own set of, of challenges, but thankfully the challenge is not a no. Um, there, there's a process to it that we, we've been able to navigate that and look forward to coordinating with a number of businesses on that. Um, regarding South Market Street, we still have South Market Street supporting um, those vendors and otherwise, and just want to update you on the numbers. Um, these numbers are inclusive of the margin of error. Uh, so since our opening or closing of South Market Street on August 15th, um, by our uh, uh, pedestrian counter, we've seen over 88,600 um, counted um, with an average per day of over 1,500. Um, so it's definitely um, getting used and otherwise definitely something that's supporting both the brick and mortar and the market street vendors um, there. Um, just a couple of other county projects and opportunities for the general public to get involved um, in some of your constituents. One is on tomorrow evening at the West Ashley Revitalization Commission. Um, the county, Charleston County will be presenting on the 7171 project, the Old Town District uh, project. Um, a lot of benefits from that. I know it was extremely controversial the first time around. <clears throat> the projects have been whittled down a little bit, but bringing some really good benefits, both of multi-use, actually improving Sumar Street in anticipation of our development um, at the old Pickley Wiggly site, um, intersection improvements, especially at Orange Grove and Sam Ritt, and the introduction of a brand new signalized intersection at Amberley as well. So um, uh, definitely uh, we'll be talking about that at the work meeting with the county. Also wanted to make sure you all are aware, US 17 corridor study um, that we um, as city staff have been stakeholders with the county on uh, has their public engagement survey up and ready for constituents to respond to through October 31st. Again, this is a prioritization process of both short-term and long-term projects. Uh, that can be pursued. This is quintessential because what it does for county, city, and state is begin to identify priorities that we as a municipality can then turn to the county and say, hey, we want to see this funded through the sales tax or um, through other particular means. So definitely want to be able to see people's, uh, uh, those who, who live, work, travel through um, from the Avondale area all the way through the Crosstown, even to the side um, um, streets like Ashley Ave. Um, um, on the peninsula to be able to add that piece in. Um, the last county one, the main road, segment C. Uh, so both segment A and segment C are uh, being both uh, reviewed and pursued. Uh, main road segment C, I know I got a notification that there's some updates they need to do to, to the website, but between October 12th and November 12th, citizens have an opportunity to look at some of those alternatives and those options and lend their voice in that process as well. And so. Just want to make sure that you're all aware of that so that your constituents get involved there. And then finally, just a reminder with our citywide maintenance plan, we are in West Ashley for this month. Um, so anything that we need to um, add work order, I mean, we have a bunch of work orders to get done, but there's other things that you all um, in the West Ashley area that we need to address. Um, please let either myself or Thomas or Michael and our, our traffic operations team know. Went through that kind of fast. So let me know what I need to clarify. Well, there's a lot going on. Thank you. Um, any questions from the committee of our director? I see um, Councilor Rappel chiming in here. You have something you want to add or question to the to the conversation? Uh, thank you, Chairman Seekings. Now I'm just listening in. I'm excited for all the good stuff y'all got going on and uh, appreciate uh, all the love and attention to West Ashley uh, in the month, month of October. It's our month. Thank okay, you. Well, Thank you for participating. I just want to say um, to this committee and anyone else who's listening, in particular, take yourself off mute. A small piece of space can make a big difference. And <laughs> there are a lot of people who had a hand in that. Um, Councilmember Brady certainly had the impetus getting it through the bike ped, but there are a lot of people who had a hand in that. And I will tell you, um, Mr. Benjamin being one of them, but the, the, the person that I really tip my hat to the most is the property owner who really got out ahead of this and sort of led the charge, got with neighbors, got with government, got with the community and really pushed this forward and had to go out and sell on the front end and then, you know, put a product out there that people like and and that property owner and business owner did that. So um, I'm hoping that as we go forward with this from a government perspective that we can partner with um, 
like-minded, responsible business and property owners who want to make things better, just not just for their business, but for the city. And I think that is a, at least early on that the, the um, indications are that is exactly what's happened up there on King and Cannon Street. So um, more to come. And I know it's a big, heavy workload for you, Keith, but um, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor and uh, seems to be very popular around the city. <laughs> we could not put all the people who have taken credit for it on that parklet, <laughs> but, but we'll try. <laughs> well, I'm happy are there. Yes, Council Member Jackson. In that vein, Chairman, I, I just, I thought it was a very interesting um, um, op-ed that was in the paper today about yep. you know, six years ago, I guess, you know, some bold um, developers thought that they would just take those matters in their hands and they weren't successful, but, and, and primarily because people still wanted to drive their vehicles, you know, um, freely up and down King Street. And I do feel like that the, that the public sentiment has changed, um, not 100%, because 100% of the people will never want to get out of their cars. But certainly in terms of a city-oriented, walkable, multimodal urban lifestyle. I think we're seeing a huge change among the population and it's just gonna keep going, so. And, and I agree with that. that. And it, it, the evidence is out there, the two sort of really, they're small projects where they've been a big deal is Market Street and now um, Cannon Street, both of which have been popular. Um, and those were both born of sort of the mandate during the times of COVID to do something different. And so far we're two for two, so that's great. Um, you all may not remember this, but there was a business owner, it's probably about six or seven years ago, who actually put a, a blow up swimming pool on King Street in one of the parking spaces. It was very popular around the business. It was not so popular with everybody else. <laughs> but um, so we've come a long way since the days of pop-up swimming pools. And I think we've got a long way to go, but we're off to a great start. And again, to staff, to this committee, to anyone else who had a hand in it, thank you. And let's, uh, let's keep the momentum going. Uh, all right. Is there anything else um, while we're all together? Keith, wh when are you thinking we're all going to get to back together again? I mean, we're about to get into budget period. Are we going to need a TNT meeting before our next um, city council meeting? Um, I don't necessarily have anything um, on the docket as of right now to okay. bring up. These agreements um, were really the only reason why we wanted to meet this time. Go ahead and get those out of the way. Um, and, you know, you, we, you all already gave us uh, a pass to wait until January to give updates on bills. We're still waiting on things anyway, so there's not really much to update there. So, um, okay. I think we're I think we're okay. I don't want to jinx myself. All right, great. Well, we'll we'll see how that goes. I really the reason I asked is I know we gave everyone a pass over the big report on the bill grant, but I just want to make sure that we keep an eye on it as we get through November and December, um, and you give us a kind of a report as to how we're doing, even if it's just that we're moving in the right direction. Still yeah, the moment, the, moment we get, the moment we get the pre-award letter, yes, which means execution of the contract, you huge. will hear from myself, Edmund, or Jason. Okay, great. Council Member Jackson? I was just going to suggest you brought up the budget word, um, Chairman, that may maybe we should just give Mr. Benjamin an invitation to, you know, send us anything in writing that he yeah. would like us to know in particular about your priorities for your budget. It's going to be some tough decisions, but we don't want to leave, you know, um, we, we don't want to leave the table without understanding what we would be gaining and losing if, if we can't fund the priorities that you've um, put together through the finance office. Well, I'm assuming that he's got, you've gone through ad hoc with that too, right? I mean, you presented to ad hoc. Yeah, I, I did my due diligence. We were able to make the necessary cuts that were requested of us and also people are, requ are requesting there, which aren't new requests. We essentially asked for permission to hire the people you all budgeted for us last year, which includes the multimodal manager position. So I think the way that we've approached it in our department has really been retaining our gains. You all have been unbelievably helpful with growing the department um, over the last um, three years since I've been here. And so our goal was really trying to retain our gains um, more so than anything. Um, and. Uh, the, the really the major the, the, the request that I made was to to hire the new inspector so we can make sure that developers are doing what they're supposed to do and and, and otherwise especially as you all consider changing um, the permit fees which will be coming to the ad hoc committee right we need to we need additional folks to monitor and then the multimodal manager so we can really get a hold of those particular issues and have somebody at the city um, dedicated uh, to that work day in and day out. Well, that's that's going to be uh, for November. We'll see how that all goes. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. All right, um, we're fast approaching our hour. Any other questions, comments, concerns? If not, we'll see everybody at 4.30 for uh, Ways and Means. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody.